Right, guys. Um, can can you all see that my title screen there and and hear my voice? Yep, loud and clear and lovely good. and visual. Good, that's good. Okay, so uh, um, okay, so so let's just uh, start off now. When I last came down to talk to you um, in Trinity, um, just about two years ago, uh, that was in the run up to the fiftieth anniversary of the Apollo Eleven landing. Um, and I did a presentation there that covered um, this, starting off um, really at World War II um, with the space race, um, the, the challenge that JFK issued to NASA to put a man on the moon and return him safely to the Earth by the end of the 60s, then the projects Mercury, Gemini and Apollo that worked towards that goal. Um, and two astronauts landed on the moon, spending two and a half hours there in July 1969. And on the safe return on the 24th of July, 1969, that was John F. Kennedy's goal achieved. Um, but they went further than that. Um, they planned Apollo missions up to Apollo 20. They cut that short, as we'll see. Um, and they wanted to explore the moon more thoroughly and do more science there. Um, they also had a thing running in parallel called the Apollo Applications Program. And what that was about was trying to look at other ways they could use the Apollo Saturn hardware. So we built um, a moon-capable rocket, but what else could they do with it was what they were thinking there. So uh, we'll look a bit at that as well. So we'll start off with Apollo 12. Um, Apollo 12 was the second moon landing mission. It launched on the 14th of November, 1969. Um, and the idea here was to um, do a pinpoint landing. Now, Apollo 11 didn't really. Apollo 11's landing was a bit messy and uh, was some way from where they'd intended it to be uh, because they went in a bit a bit long and then Neil Armstrong had to manoeuvre around to find a safe space to land. Um, but Apollo 12, they wanted to do this because they wanted to rendezvous with Surveyor 3, which was one of the unmanned craft that were sent to the moon um, earlier on just to verify that you could land on the moon actually but uh, uh, so that was there from 1967. Um, they wanted to get some better pictures so unlike Apollo 11 they managed to take up a color tv camera uh, to get color pictures of the moon um, and unfortunately as soon as they took that out of its box it got pointed at the sun and that was the end of that. Uh, cameras of that time were very fragile uh, and of course uh, sunlight on the moon is, is very harsh and bright with no atmosphere to uh, attenuate it. So um, that was the camera was destroyed, unfortunately. Then the launch, um, well, the launch um, in November 1969, it went really quite well um, for the first 36 seconds. And then things started to go badly wrong. Trouble free launch. And then all hell busted loose. I just lost a whole bunch of stuff. But I think we just had a whole bunch of buses drop out. Okay, Houston, uh, we just lost the platform here, gang. I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. I got three fuel cell lights, an AC bus light, a fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload one and two, main bus A and B out. We had some big glitch here, gang. I got AC. Got AC? Yes. Maybe it's just the indicator. What do you got on the main bus? 24 volts. That's low. We got a short on it of some kind, but I can't believe that's accurate. Flight Ecom. Go Ecom. I think it's a fuel cell bus failure. They've been thrown offline somehow. That must be why we're getting garbage here. Can they try SCE to AUX? Jared Griffin had never heard that command before. I'm pretty sure most of the people Mission Control had. Tell him. Apollo 12, Houston. Try SCE to auxiliary. Over. FCE to auxiliary? What the hell is that? CE. I'm not sure even Pete knew what that was. One person did. I, I know what that is. Uh, SCE docks. We're, we're getting good telemetry from you again. Try to reset your fuel cells. Reset fuel cells. Wait for staging. Wait for staging, yes. Hang on. Copy that, Pete. You're looking good. So there you are. Keep calm and SE to auxiliary. Um, so really what happened there um, is, is that they lost 
their entire electrical system, but there was a spare battery and someone knew where to flick the switch to kick that in. Now, I would have thought by modern standards of health and safety that that would be the end of the mission. Um, but it was not. Um, Apollo 12 went to the moon. It made its pinpoint landing. It uh, uh, was otherwise faultless after that. But I think in this day and age, that would be the end of the mission. And there would be quite a lot of, uh, you know, investigation as to what had gone wrong and so on. But they, they're thinking of, the, of that sort of 1969 health and safety attitude was the only thing that really bothered them was whether the lightning strikes had damaged the um, the mechanism of, of the um, of the parachutes that they'd need to actually splash down in the sea. Um, and they sort of thought, well, does it make any difference if we go to the moon and back or not? And the answer was no. So they said, well, let's go to the moon then. So they did it, um, which, which that was a very, very great success, Apollo 12. But uh, Apollo 13, of course, was the next mission. And uh, um, they intended, the, the Lovell, Swigert and Hayes intended to land at Fra Moro except that uh, there was a slight problem during the launch with where one of the engines shut down early, but that wasn't really a problem because the other four could just burn a bit longer to get them to where they needed to be. Um, people were starting to lose interest by Apollo 13 as well. They'd, they'd been to the moon twice now, and the, the TV audiences were um, were sort of, uh, you know, not bothering to turn up and so on. So, um, but then this all changed very suddenly. There was an explosion in one of the fuel cells and the whole mission changed from going to the moon to getting back from the moon. So let's just have a quick look at a clip from the, uh, the film Apollo 13. This is, this is what happened. What did you do? Nothing. I stirred the tanks. Whoa. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Now, what's gone on there is that um, they did a routine thing, stirring up the tanks, which, as I understand it, is the same as um, a fuel gauge. I'm just getting a little warning about my internet connection here. Can someone tell you if you still hear me? Yeah, can still coming in. That's right. Yeah, coming in loud and clear, Paul. Yes, clear, well, that, that's all right. Sometimes Zoom comes up with these little things where it says, uh, you know, your internet's uh, about to drop out or something. Um, does happen, but uh, yeah. So, so they they were stirring the tanks, and uh, uh, that's a way of gauging how much fuel is actually left in them, oxygen in this case. Um, unlike in your car, uh, where you know everything's under gravity, and so you have just a little flotation device that shows up on your dashboard how much fuel you've got um, that doesn't work in outer space because with zero gravity it's all over the place so you stir it up and you can figure out how much is uh, how much is in there how that happens i don't exactly know but that's what it does um, and this tank was a friday afternoon job and um, it had been dropped in the factory only a couple of inches but it was enough to just damage it and also had been tested um, under the wrong voltage um, 65 volts instead of 28 and that damaged the internal wiring so this accident waiting to happen uh, when Fred Hayes flicked that switch it happened and um, there was an explosion and the whole side of the spacecraft was was blown off so what happened next they went into a whole sequence um, of decisions to to get through this um, so here we are 55 hours 54 minutes into the mission the tank exploded then they looked at what happened they decided not to do direct abort i.e turn around and come back but instead to go around the moon they decided not to try and use their own rocket um, but instead to use the rocket on the lunar module and therefore they decided shortly afterwards to power up the lunar module and power down the command and service module um, they had an evaluation of whether they had enough consumables and stuff they obviously did they had to do a few things, um, and they made that decision to change the rocket burn so that instead of going into lunar orbit, they would just flip around the moon and come straight back. Um, an interesting part of the film, Apollo 13, there, um, Ron Howard's excellent account of this. It gets most things right, but it makes a few little mistakes. And you can see um, 
uh, Tom Hanks playing Jim Lovell, uh, doing the calculation for that re free return burn there. Um, and he's using a space pen and a piece of paper. And that's correct because the first handheld pocket calculator was actually invented the year after Apollo 13 by Hewlett Packard, uh, 1971. Um, but what you see, if you look closely, this is a very nerdy thing, and I, I love that sort of thing. Um, he's doing addition on this piece of paper, and he's getting a man on the ground to check he's working. And your man on the ground is checking he's working using a slide rule. And here is the thing that those of you of a certain age may be aware that one thing a slide rule can't do is add up. It does multiplication, division, squares, logs, and all sorts of amazing stuff. Um, but actually, if you want to add up, you want an abacus, not a slide rule. So that's, uh, that's, that was an interesting little uh, error in that film. Um, they then took the decision to, to burn extra fuel to, to speed up the return. Um, and they started to get worried about carbon dioxide. Now, you've seen in the film, and this is true, um, that uh, because the lunar module and the command module were made by different manufacturers, they had simply um, solved the same problem two different ways, and one had square pipes and one had round pipes. So real Blue Peter stuff, getting those two to work together so they could lose, use the command module um, canisters, um, lithium hydroxide to sort of scrub the CO2 out of the air. Um, and uh, use that in the lunar module. So then they did that. They spent several hours getting mostly home. Um, they got most of the way back, and they actually had, because they'd switched everything off, they had to line up um, the, the, the rocket burn for mid course correction just using the terminator of the Earth um, as soon, seen through the window, and it was good enough. So there we are. That was. Uh, they did that, they, uh, they had to power up the command module, ditch the lunar module, um, and they went for splashdown in the Pacific. And they, they called it, in the end, they called it a successful failure because uh, no astronauts were lost, even though they didn't actually make it to the moon. And you see the picture here, actually, that's a picture they managed to get um, just before, they, um, just before they, they went back into the command module of the damage that had been done. Uh, you see there's a whole side of the spacecraft missing there. So they are Apollo 13, successful failure, not a failure. Um, Apollo 14, um, Alan Shepard, Stu Ruser, and Ed Mitchell, they took on what was supposed to be Apollo 13's mission, i.e. landing in the Framora Highlands. Um, Alan Shepard, um, he'd had, I believe, um, an ear problem. Or did he have a heart problem? One of, one of him, Shepard and Slayton, were both grounded um, at the uh, time of the Mercury program and they put in charge the astronaut office instead because they both had slight medical problems um, but Shepard got over his Alan Shepard he got over his and he he was given the command of Apollo 14 um, it was it, there were some modifications made to it after the the, the experience of learning about Apollo 13 um, they did have some problems with actually doing the docking and it actually took them six goes to get the lunar module docked on the command and service module that's on the way to the moon. Um, that the, the, uh, the mechanism had been left in the wrong position and they had to sort of smash it together six times before it went clunk and joined up. I would, I would worry about doing that again if uh, I was in that position. Um, they also did something that they hadn't had to do before which was put a patch on the Apollo guidance computer. There was a, just a, um, a faulty light that was uh, that was coming on, um, which would have required them to abort the mission if it had come on during the actual descent. So they realized it was a software problem. And for the first time ever, they remotely patched the computer. Um, problems with the radar on the way down as well. Um, but actually, Alan Shepard landed manually, most accurately of all the Apollos. Um, he's most famous, however, for playing golf on the moon. Uh, Houston, while you're looking at it up, you might recognize what I have in my hand is the uh, handle for the re contingency sample return. It just so happens to have a genuine six iron on the bottom of it. In my left hand, I have a little white pellet that's familiar to millions of Americans. Uh, drop it down. Unfortunately, the suit is so stiff, I can't do this with two hands, but I'm going to try a little sand trap shot here. Good 
Okay, they got more dirt than ball left side. The four dirt than ball, here we go again. That looked like a slice to me, Al. There we go. Three of the die, one more. Miles and miles and miles. Very good, Dan. So there we go. That's um, now some say that's 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 a record golf shot, even more than Tiger Woods. That he must have hit that all oh, six hundred yards quite easily. Um, but actually, when you analyse pictures that they've got there and and the videos, um, he didn't hit that ball much more than forty yards. I'm afraid. Um, so not really miles and miles and miles as such, but um, um, but nevertheless, um, something of a record uh, for being the only golf played on the moon, as far as we know. And there we are. That's uh, that's Kitty Hawk, Apollo 14's capsule, and that's uh, that's me. That is at the Kennedy Space Center on display now, which is a fantastic place. If you haven't been to the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, when all this gets sorted out and that kind of travel becomes possible again, I thoroughly recommend a trip there and you do need to spend two or three days going around everything to see it all um, magnificent place so the next apollo july and august 1971 um, command service module endeavor lunar module falcon that's apollo 15 um, and this was different from the previous uh, three landing missions in that this one had a an enlarged lunar module um, designed to accommodate the Lunar Rover, a four-wheeled electric vehicle weighing 209 kilograms, um, and they changed uh, they changed the flight profile and the fuel a bit to uh, to get that extra weight to the moon, uh, and they went uh, to Hadley Rill and they did four EVAs, three of which were the Lunar Rover. The first one obviously was to uh, take out the Lunar Rover and put it together. Um, they had to have increased capacity in the spacesuits. And uh, that had a bit of problems with water and O2 leaks, but nothing uh, terribly things. But there was a big scandal around it all, and that's that um, um, Scott and Irwin had had got involved with a dodgy stamp dealer, um, and they got some stamps, first day covers, stamped on the moon, um, and sold through, I believe, a German stamp dealer for rather a lot of money. Um, and the the result of that was that actually all three astronauts were told they weren't flying ever again. Scott would make history, cancelling a stamp on an interplanetary envelope. I'm very proud to have the opportunity here to play postman. What could be a better place to cancel a stamp than right here at Hadley Rill? Now, just a, a little aside to that, that, uh, that, that Al Warden actually came to, to Ireland um, uh, a few years ago. Now, I didn't get to see him myself, I'm afraid. Um, but I'm told that he did say that he felt a little bit hard done by, um, you know, being banned from going into space again over that because he was he was the command module pilot and, and was, wasn't involved in it. Um, so you know you can you can have sympathy with that view. Well, you know with whether he knew about it or not, nobody knows. But uh, only he does. But um, that that was the stamp controversy. But they did other things as well. Well, in my left hand I have a, a feather. In my right hand a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago, who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, Which proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. So there we are. Good to have a, a bit of uh, science theory confirmed in practice. There, that, uh, I think we, I think we knew that one was the case, but it's good to see it uh, on the moon. Now then, there's um, a picture of the of the lunar rover and just a few things um, about it. It's a it's a fully electric 
um, four-wheel drive vehicle. Um, it's got a radio link directly to Earth. It is not dependent upon the lunar lander for its radio link to Earth. It's got its own uh, link, and we'll see where that comes in useful a bit later. Um, but they drove that round. They did. They did three EVAs in Apollo 15, and uh, and more indeed in uh, Apollo 16 and 17, and really got quite away from uh, from the lunar lander. Um, this is the thing for me that I find absolutely extraordinary, um, being of that age. This is 1971. Um, now it's only in the last year that Americans have actually had the means of putting men into space again since the space shuttle was retired in 2011. Um, so as of you know a year ago, um, the Americans were totally dependent on the Russians to get men in even into low Earth orbit. And yet, when I was 10, they were driving electric cars on the moon. So what happened to progress then? What happened there? I've never, never quite worked that one out. OK, so Apollo 16, um, a great team of uh, John Young, Charlie Duke and Ken Mattingly. Um, on that crew, um, John Young and Charlie Duke went down to the lunar surface. Um, slight problem with the launch, but uh, they got that sorted out and it went up on the 16th of April, 1972, um, to the Descartes Highlands. And they drove that rover a total of 16.6 miles on the lunar surface, which is quite um, quite amazing, and did various experiments. Well, up there, I have some footage here of them driving the, uh, the, the the rover around, and it's quite fabulous. They treat it like a go kart, which I think is amazing. But uh, here we go. Come out, Danny. Back's on, Mark. That max acceleration? No. Oh. Man, you are really bouncing. Is he on the ground at all? Yeah, that's ten kilometers. Huh? He's got about two wheels on the ground. He's a big rooster tail out of all four wheels. And as he turns, he skids. The back end breaks loose just like on snow. Come on back, John. Hey, the deck is running. Man, I'll tell you, Andy's never seen a driver like this. and starts bouncing is when he gets his rooster tail. He makes sharp turns. Hey, that was a good stop. Those wheels just locked. Mark off. Okay. Do you want to do it one more time? Yeah. Got about a minute and five seconds that okay. time. Mark on. Okay, you could have gone the other way. Go ahead. There's the big craters there, though, aren't they? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. We got enough of the Grand Prix. We're willing to let you go on from here. Call out a Grand Prix. Okay. Man, that was all four wheels off the ground there. Okay, max stop. Okay, I don't want to do that. Okay, excuse me. They say that's a no no. I think John Young was slightly concerned there that if he. Uh, if he stopped too hard, then there was a possibility that he might get stuck, um, and then and they'd be in, in deep trouble. But uh, the way they threw that around, with this, you know, it looked like handbrake turns and stuff, didn't it? But uh, uh, that's that, that's good. That's the Lunar Rover, a fabulous machine. Right then, so uh, the final uh, moon landing um, was Apollo seventeen. Um, Gene Cern and Ron Evans and Harrison Schmidt went up on the 7th of December 1972. Schmidt was unique in being the first geologist they actually got to the moon. Um, and uh, he was actually brought forward from the cancelled Apollo 18 
um, just so that they could get a scientist on the moon. All, all the others were astronauts. They were test pilots and whatever. Uh, um, Schmidt was a geologist, and that was important. Um, it was also unique being the only Saturn V night launch. Uh, it was the longest. I saw there was a question come up about that, but uh, it, it, it was the longest um, you know, moon landing with a total of 22 hours, 3 minutes and 57 seconds of, of three EVAs, um, all about seven hours and a bit long. So uh, it was, you know, a thorough finish to the to the uh, to the Apollo program. So let's uh, have a look at that launch. Just thirty seconds and continuing on now. Continuing on at the T minus twenty six second mark. T minus twenty five. We'll get a final guidance uh, release at the T minus seventeen second mark. T minus seventeen. Final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at eight point nine seconds. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. Two, one, zero. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the areas. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the path. It has now cleared the tower. Roger, tower, you're off complete. We're in the roll, Bob. It's been a looking great for us doing all five engines. Okay, babe, it's looking good. Your roll is complete. We are pitching. Wow, we Okay, babe. Let's check the angle. 30 seconds, we're going up. Man, oh, well. 30 seconds and uh, 17 is go. 17, you're go. Okay, one minute, 68 degrees. Okay. Everything looks great over here, today. okay? Okay. Stand by for Max, coming through Max 2. We'll be at 68 degrees. Okay, okay. 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 Change, stand by for mode 1 Bravo. Mark, mode 1 Bravo. Roger, 1 Bravo, we're going 1 minute. Change, you're looking great. Right on the line. Okay, we got the RCS command. Change, you're feet wet, feet wet. Roger, feet wet. Yeah, this thing shakes like the sun. Yeah, that's max Q. Wait till we get out of max Q. Stay down there, Q meter. Yeah. Okay. 130 about 50 degrees. 50 degrees. Okay, right on. 130 and we are go, Bob. Yeah, you're looking great. Good. Two G's. Two and a half G's. See it quiet down after max Q. Yeah, quiet down. That's fascinating. And the, the, the thing that um, amazed me about it the first time I saw that is, of course, uh, the camera uh, can, can see, as you see here, the rocket um, on the launch pad. But as soon as they light the engines, the light is so bright that you can no longer see any of the rocket because it's in darkness. And, uh, um, of course, the, you know, the light that comes from the, the, the burning of the rocket fuel is, is much, much brighter than anything that's uh, reflecting off the, the rocket. The other thing um, I think I noticed there that... Um, I've watched enough footage of these Saturn V launches to realize, well, here is the rocket and it is 360 feet tall. Um, and then I've watched it in flight and it goes up and think, well, if that's 360 feet of rocket, then how much fire is behind it? And I, 
I come to the conclusion that the flame behind the rocket um, is about a quarter of a mile, or I should say about 400 meters, as you as you guys are in the south. Um, that uh, you know, it's it's really um, a long way, a quarter of a mile, uh, just for fire um, that is propelling that rocket forwards. Um, the other thing uh, I noticed, if you listen to the commentary there. Um, they kept saying that the G-force kept increasing up to about 3.5 as they were uh, going on in the mission. That's because this is all fuel, and it's it's this bit that's really burning all the fuel um, in the first stage. Of course, at the beginning, there's 7.5 million pounds of thrust, um, and all of this weighs about 6.5 million pounds. So it moves off the pad very slowly. But the acceleration increases and increases because all this fuel is burning and therefore the whole thing gets lighter and lighter as it goes. So your rate of acceleration increases, of course, until after uh, two minutes and 30 seconds into the mission or thereabouts um, and the first stage fuel is done and then they light up the second stage. So uh, uh, that's that's the uh, the anatomy of a Saturn V launch. Now then, this is liftoff. Watch this carefully. I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your good. Excellent. Good Pick over. over. Now here you have good thrust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Now then, the uh, the conspiracy theorists love this because they regard it as proof positive that this is all shot in a film studio because it's a very nice camera work by a cameraman, um, except that, hang on a minute, the only two people on the moon were in there and, they, and you saw them leave. So how did this work? And actually what happened was this. Um, we saw earlier that the lunar rover has its own uh, satellite link to Earth. Not, it's not a satellite, sorry, it's a dish, you know, a dish, um, an RF dish is pointed at Earth. It's got its own radio link and it's got its own camera, which was put on there. And what they did was they controlled that camera from mission control and they anticipated, you know, the one and a quarter second delay and everything. Uh, and a man maneuvered that camera where he thought the spacecraft would be taking into account all the delays and whatever, and he got it right. However, he didn't get it right the first time because this was Apollo 17, um, and he had tried to do it on Apollos 15 and 16 and learned from his mistakes and, and got it right on, on uh, this one. So let's just have a look at that again, shall we? Fourth stage, fourth. Engine arm is down. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. See how it's done. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one, ignition. So there you go. That was uh, Apollo 17. And that, that was actually all the Apollos that actually flew. Now, let's just have a, a look at these, because this on the left here is the original mission plan um, after Apollo 11. That, uh, Apollo, um, Apollo 12 went as planned. Uh, 13 uh, didn't because it didn't actually get to the moon. But uh, then 14 was planned to be um, a different destination. 15 was planned to be the last uh, flight without the lunar rover, not the first with it. So that was cancelled. 15 effectively was cancelled. Uh, and then they changed the uh, destinations for these. Well, they the first one that cancelled was Apollo 20 because they decided at that point they wanted its Saturn V to be Skylab. Um, then 18 and 19, they never went either. Um, and there was bits of changes of destinations. So what they really cancelled um, was 15, 19 and 20 because although they changed the destinations for 16, 17, and 18, um, that they, they were, and, and 15, they, they were the, um, the flights, 15, 16, and 17, as they were, were the flights that went with the lunar rover. Um, so that's, uh, 
what the difference between what actually happened here and uh, and what was originally planned but so they they that was the end actually of the moon landing apollos but not the end of the story there was the apollo applications program now what they wanted to do here was just to find out what they could do with the Saturn V. And they had all sorts of amazing plans for it to, to actually go on from, uh, from Apollo 17. They wanted to build a, in four phases a lunar base from 1969 to 76. Um, they wanted to build a lunar exploration system for Apollo, which is where they built a base and went out from it. Um, they decided if they were going to have a base there, they'd need an escape system to, to get off the moon if they needed to urgently. Um, this is the crazy one they were going to do, and they actually planned it all out, a manned Venus flyby. Uh, and the only one on that list they actually did was Skylab. Um, and there's, there's Skylab. Um, let's have a look at it. Right, so there were four Skylab missions, and the first of which was an unmanned launch of the lab itself um, on, the, on Apollo 20 Saturn V launched on May the 14th, 1973, um, and things didn't go terribly well. There were, there were some problems with it, and there was some damage suffered on the way up that the, uh, one of the shields um, broke, uh, one of the solar panels was lost, a second one jammed. Uh, so they had to, the first thing they had to do on the first manned mission um, was to sort these things out. And that went up on May the 25th, 1973, on a Saturn 1B rocket. Now they... Um, they did this. The Saturn 1Bs had previously launched from Launch Complex 34, um, where the Apollo 1 fire took place. And um, Apollo 7 was a Saturn 1B, which launched from that um, launch pad, uh, and as was Apollo 5, an unmanned Saturn 1B. Um, but this one, Skylab 2, they launched from uh, Launch Complex 39B, i.e. The, the spare Apollo um, pad. And um, they had to put this, what they called the milking stool here, just to lift it up to the right height so that the top of the Saturn 1B is, is at the same place where a Saturn 5 would be, except that there's this much of a rocket missing there um, because the Saturn 1B is a much smaller rocket, only capable of going to low Earth orbit. Um, so they went up there and uh, in 28 days, they sorted a few things out and uh, did some experimental work. Uh, then Skylab 3, similar um, similar rocket, but a much longer mission, 59-day stay in space there with uh, a lot of science done on it. And Skylab 4, um, November 16th, 1973, for 84 days. So into, into 1974 there. Um, and that was it. That was the end of... Uh, there was talk of a, Saturn fi of a, of a, sorry, of a Skylab 5, um, but that never happened. And so Skylab at that point was abandoned. Here's a few pictures of what they had inside. This was really the, um, th this was the third stage of a Saturn V converted into living quarters effectively. So uh, here we go. There's uh, plenty of room in there to do exercise and science and stuff in zero gravity. Um, you can even have a sort of a, a shower of some sort. I'm not sure whether that's a wet shower or a dry shower and how you deal with, with water all over the place in zero gravity. Um, but lots of work going on there. Waste management compartment, which looks remarkably like a kitchen sink to me. Um, but uh, they did. They, they they stayed there for up to eighty four days in that uh, in that environment. <clears throat> um, we'll come back to Skylab in a moment. Excuse me, just a second. Now this was the um, the shall we say ambitious, maybe maybe even a little crazy, um, the Apollo Venus flyby mission. And what they were doing there is they wanted to build, they didn't do it, they wanted to build something like a Skylab, another Skylab effectively with huge living quarters um, and powered by, uh, you know, take, taken into orbit by a Saturn V. And leaving Earth here on April the 5th, 1972, and then travelling on a sunward sort of orbit and doing a fly past Venus, can't land or anything like that, no landers, just, just whizzing past and taking some photos close up and passing there on August the 23rd, 1972, when an Earth wasn't too far away then, so the radio communication uh, was quite straightforward. Uh, and then looping around 
out going outside of Earth's orbit. So then slowing down and meeting up with Earth again on the 30th of March, 1973, just under a year later. Um, now, that seems to me uh, ambitious. Here's, here's what they intended to, uh, to do it with. This is a Saturn V. And uh, again, the, the, the Apollo Command and Service module would, would be there. They would come back um, in a normal splashdown in the, in the Apollo uh, Command module there. Um, but they would live in this stage, the third stage of the Saturn V, um, fitted out with living quarters. But then when they finished with it, they vent out all the remaining fuel and fill it up full of air. Um, then you've got this docking module here that docks that part of the Saturn to the to the uh, Apollo here, um, uh, solar um, solar panels for electricity, and a life support system to, to hold food, water, um, oxygen, and whatever. Yeah, so it, it could have it could have worked. Now my big concern, I would say, is could you put three men on a mission like that for a year without them going nuts? I mean that you know that would be a difficult one to. Uh, to know, wouldn't it? But um, it, uh, it it might have happened. Um, it didn't happen because by that time, all the money had been pulled out of Apollo, um, and um, oh, they 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 started doing the space shuttle, which is a whole other story that I might talk about sometime. Um, and uh, of course, they needed the Vietnam War, needed money, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, uh, none of this ever happened. Apollo really, at that point, was pretty much abandoned. They had all sorts of other things they were doing as well. They even had a nuclear um, rocket stage um, that they tested out on the ground. Uh, that basically was a nuclear reactor that, uh, that had water going through it and came out the other end very, very hot and fast. Um, so that was, uh, you know, Nerva. That was called. And uh, so that was it. Um, the, the final thing they did was this one. This was an amazing uh, mission that had quite far-reaching implications, the Apollo Soyuz Test Project. And you may read in some places that this was Apollo 18. This was not Apollo 18. The Apollo bit of it was simply called Apollo, and the Soyuz bit was simply called Soyuz. But it came out of uh, an agreement between uh, Richard Nixon um, and Kosygin in 1972 as part of detente, that uh, sort of idea that rather than have the Cold War, that the Russians and Americans would start speaking to each other and doing things together. And um, the, so, so an Apollo here and a Soyuz docked in low Earth orbit. Um, three, three astronauts went up on the Apollo, uh, two, two Soviet cosmonauts, uh, Leonov and Kubasov on the, on the Soyuz there. Um, Deke Slayton finally got into space. He was one of the original Mercury 7, um, and he had, um, he had a heart problem, I think, a heart fibrillation thing, and, uh, uh, and he um, got that sorted medically. Um, and so he he got his he got his flight on on the, the last Apollo. Um, so they launched the Apollo there, fifteenth of July. Uh, so, uh, sorry, they launched um, Soyuz first on the fifteenth of July. Then later the same day, um, Apollo, not Apollo eighteen, uh, and that carried the docking module on top of the second stage of the Saturn one B, um, which which was where the lunar module would be in theory. Um, they trained. Now, this was a really interesting bit of getting the, the Americans and the Russians to work together. Um, they had to train in each other's countries uh, and they learned to speak each other's language. And they found actually it worked best um, that, that um, if the Russians spoke English and the Americans spoke Russian. Um, I can, I can uh, identify with that myself because I once found myself um, in Italy speaking no Italian. Um, and uh, trying to order a meal from a waiter who spoke no English. But we actually found we got along just fine speaking French, because um, which we both could. So that was good. Um, there was the pool table incident. Now, the pool table thing, was, this is funny. Um, while they were, uh, while the American astronauts were training in, in, in Russia in, um, uh, you know, Star City, um, they had a lot of spare time. And one of the things they started to wonder is, were they being bugged? Now, this was the Soviet Union in the 1970s, so the answer was probably yes. So uh, Tom Stafford had this great idea 
where what he did was uh, was he started a conversation with the guy say guys um we've got a lot of spare time here wouldn't it be great if we had a pool table just to pass the time whatever um and the following day a pool table appeared so there we go um they they did um oh sorry they did all their science and whatever together and uh um, and actually, Alexei Leonov and Tom Stafford became lifelong close friends. Um, the cooperation stopped really not very long afterwards when the Russians invaded Afghanistan and all the whole sort of detente thing went a bit off the boil at that. But having done this, having built a docking mechanism that can convert Russian um, you know, electrics and whatever to, to, to American sand electrics and found that it worked, that came in handy later when they started doing missions, joint missions between um, the Russian Mir space station and the space shuttle. And then, of course, further on, and to our benefit to this day, um, the, the, the joint building of the International Space Station, when the, the Americans really realized that they couldn't resource um, you know, um, space station freedom, they wanted to call it, um, them, themselves, and they had to involve other countries. The fact that they had already done uh, you know, docking with, with Russian spacecraft came in very handy. And actually, it's to our benefit in Ireland here, um, this bit, because um, we can see uh, that, that the International Space Station going over. Uh, in fact, we're seeing it pretty much every night this month. It's a great month for, for space station passes. Um, and the reason we see it at, at our latitude is that in order to secure Russian money, it needed to be visible from Moscow. So it was put in a sort of a, uh, perhaps a higher orbit than uh, a more inclined orbit than it might otherwise have been. So that um, was the Apollo Soyuz test project. Uh, this is the, the team. There's the team with uh, a model of their, of their two spacecraft there. Um, Deke Slate and Tom Stafford, Vance Brand, Alexei Leonov, and uh, I forgot his front name, Kubasov. Um, and, and that's the Soyuz there, and the and the Apollo spacecraft. Um, so that's uh, that's Apollo Soyuz. One more thing. One more thing. 1979. Uh, now then, had there been a Skylab five, it may have been possible to boost Skylab into a higher orbit, um, but it wasn't. And had the shuttle been ready sooner than it was it might have been possible for the shuttle to have rescued Skylab, but neither of those things happened. Um, solar activity in the mid-70s was quite high, um, and that increased the atmospheric drag on Skylab, and the, the bottom line of which was that, uh, just like the Chinese rocket yesterday, um, Skylab encountered the atmosphere um, and was brought down into an uninhabited part of Western Australia on the 11th of July, 1979. So that's really the end of... Uh, of all the you know all the Saturn V flights. Now you could get, at the time, this 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 young lady is modelling here the the Skylab protective helmet, which you could buy for very reasonable prices. Not only that, it came with a full money back guarantee that if you were killed by Skylab, you would get your money back on your protective helmet. Um, so that's that's good to know. So that really um, is just there's just one thing I'm going to mention here about the whole Apollo program. This is the solar cycles of the 20th century, and indeed a little bit into the 21st. And one thing you notice actually is that here, solar cycle 20, where the entire Apollo program took place, um, was, was the smallest for a couple of decades either side. Um, so uh, they were very, very lucky. We never got to find out what would actually happen um, if a solar flare happened during an Apollo mission, because there weren't any. Um, but uh, I think we have uh, a bit of luck to thank there um, that Solar Cycle 20 turned out to be not very deep. So I think that's about all I have to say. Um, I'm quite happy to take any questions. If you want to unmute and talk to me. Okay, Paul. So the first question comes in there from Dermot Farrell, and he asks, which mission spent the longest time on the surface of the moon? Yeah, I think we sort of touched on that a bit. It, it was Apollo 17. The whole, the whole uh, ethos was that, you know, Apollo 11 just kind of went there to check that they could get there and get back. And then each subsequent mission spent a bit longer. And, of course, the three uh, missions, 15, 16, and 17, 
uh, they had the rover, so they could do a whole lot more while they were there. Um, and each one of those was longer than the one before. So the last mission, um, Apollo 17, uh, which, of course, had a geologist on it, uh, that was the one that spent most time on the moon. OK, um, Ronald asks, on a very practical level, how did they manage body functions being in space for 11 days? Um, yeah, I mean, they had sort of, you know, they had the machinery to make it all possible. Um, and they also made the necessity for it um, as, as minimum as possible by sort of, you know, it was it was built into their diets. Um, that I don't you know, for example, I don't think a tin of baked beans would be on the cards, you know. Um, and and uh, so um, so a combination of diet and technology. They had a space sort of behind the three seats that they could go into to do all that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, it's good, good. And Samuel McLaughlin asks, is there any recommended books on the topic? There, there are loads of books um, on the topic now. It's a, it's a long time, actually, that um, since I've read them, because, you know, because um, it it's a long time ago. But the best one, all of the astronauts, most all of the, all of the astronauts, I think, have written a book. And the best one, and I think this is not just my opinion, but generally accepted to be the case, um, was the book written by astronaut Michael Collins, who passed away very recently. Um, actually, uh, Michael Collins, he was the guy on Apollo 11 um, who uh, had to stay there and conceivably would have had to come home by himself. Um, he wrote a book called Carrying the Fire, um, and it's an absolutely brilliant read. He was also, uh, Michael Collins has another claim to fame, which I think I think is right up there with one small step, actually. Um, he was the capsule communicator. Um, when Apollo 8 was launching. And Michael Collins was the guy who gave the instruction to the Apollo 8 astronauts, said, Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. TLI is translunar injection. That's the rocket burn that took those three men out of Earth orbit for the very first time. That was when men left Earth's gravity for the first time, when Michael Collins said, Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. So I think that's a pretty uh, good, uh, um, you know, that's a pretty good quote. And his book is is, is my favourite one. Okay. Um, Jerry Griffin from Dublin asks, what about Buzz Aldrin's car?